Hi, and welcome to the American Society of ECHO E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi, and I am chair of the ASC Emerging ECHO Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the comment box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. Today's topic will be aortic regurgitation. It is my pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Noreen Kelly. Dr. Kelly is a clinical cardiologist and director of the echocardiography lab at Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute in Charlotte, North Carolina. As director, she oversees the operations of one of the highest volume echo labs in the country, performing approximately 90,000 echoes per year. Dr. Kelly completed her internal medicine residency at Massachusetts General Hospital, her cardiovascular fellowship training at Brigham and Women's, followed by an advanced echocardiography fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital. She is a member of the second cohort of the American Society Beco Leadership Academy. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. Our expert today is Dr. James Lee. Dr. Lee is an advanced imaging cardiologist at the Henry Ford Heart Vascular Institute for Structural Heart Disease in Detroit, Michigan, where he also serves as an associate director of echocardiography. After receiving his medical degree at Wayne State University in Detroit, Dr. Lee completed his residency in internal medicine at Emory University in Atlanta. He then did an advanced imaging fellowship in cardiovascular CT and MRI at the Piedmont Hospital. Heart Institute in Atlanta, and subsequently went on to train in general cardiology with a focus on interventional echo at the University of Washington in Seattle. In addition to authoring many book chapters and review articles on valvular heart disease, he is a co-author on the 2017 American College of Cardiology Expert Consensus Decision Pathway for Transcatheter Aortic Valve Replacement and the Management of Adults with Aortic Stenosis. Dr. Lee additionally sits on the American College of Cardiology Imaging Section Leadership Council, where he leads the multidisciplinary structural heart disease work group. Welcome, Dr. Lee, and thank you for being our expert today. Hi, pleasure to be here. Our speaker today is Cody Fry. Cody is a cardiac sonographer and her education and an education coordinator at Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. She graduated from Atrium Health Sonography Program in 2016 and is a member of the ASC and upcoming faculty this year at the ASC Virtual Scientific Sessions. Welcome, Cody, and we look forward to your presentation today. Thank you, Lucy. Good evening, my name is Cody Fry. And I am a sonographer at Atrium Health Maine in Charlotte, North Carolina, like Lucy said. And tonight I will be presenting on the topic of aortic regurgitation. Thank you for joining me. The presentation today is largely based on the ASC guidelines from 2017 for the non-invasive evaluation of native valvular regurgitation and on the 2009 recommendations for the evaluation of prosthetic valves with echocardiography and Doppler ultrasound. Tonight, we will discover the classification and mechanisms of aortic regurgitation and then move into how to logically assess and quantify the severity of aortic regurgitation using 2D imaging, Doppler methods, and transesophageal evaluation. We will then briefly touch on what is different when evaluating a prosthetic valve, and to finish, we will look at a few cases. We will first discuss the classifications of aortic regurgitation and the variety of mechanisms by which it occurs. It is important to move through an examination of aortic regurgitation with the question of mechanism in mind, as this will determine the repairability of the valve and the timing of intervention. This table from the 2017 recommendations suggests three types or classifications of mechanisms by which aortic regurgitation may occur. 
This classification of mechanisms is adapted from the Carpentier classification used for mitral regurgitation. Type 1 encompasses regurgitation with normal cusp motion with aortic dilatation or cusp per perforation. Type 2 includes cusp prolapse, and type 3 is classified as cusp restriction. This table addresses the possible etiology of the various mechanisms. As you can see, there are many different causes of aortic regurgitation, and these are important insofar as they can help us solidify which mechanism is presently contributing to the regurgitation. Now we will dive into the assessment of the severity of aortic regurgitation. This table from the 2017 guidelines defines classes of severity in terms of structural parameters, qualitative Doppler, semi-quantitative parameters, and quantitative parameters. A combination of these parameters will determine our grading of severity. We will return to this as a touchstone in our discussion of each of these parameters. This algorithm suggests a simple comprehensive approach to integrating the multiple previously mentioned parameters and grading aortic uh, regurgitation severity. You can see how it initially suggests that we use a combination of qualitative and semi-quantitative parameters to put the severity into one of two buckets mild or severe. If there are four or more criteria met for the mild AR, further quantification isn't needed. If there are four or more of the criteria met for severe AR, quantification may still be helpful. But in most cases, the grading of severity may have discordant values or may be incomplete. This invites us to a deep, deeper level of investigation, which employs quantitative methods. In assessing severity of aortic regurgitation, we utilize 2D and 3D echo imaging, various Doppler methods, and transesophageal echo when necessary. We will discuss each of these methods in detail. When evaluating complicated valvular pathology, image optimization is a must. and may mean collaborating with a senior sonographer when imaging is difficult. In order to begin to evaluate aortic regurgitation, we start by looking at the aortic valve structure and the left ventricular size and geometry. When aortic regurgitation is appreciated on transthoracic echo, painstaking effort must be taken on 2D and even 3D imaging to give insight into the valve anatomy and the mechanism of the regurgitation. It is ideal to visualize the valve in the peristernal long axis, short axis, apical, and subcostal windows to adequately appreciate the valve anatomy. As I mentioned before, close attention to such details such as resolution settings, focal zone placement, and gain and compression can make or break a study. Above, one can appreciate the marked difference in image quality just by changing the resolution setting. In the image on the right, the thickening and restriction of the leaflets is much more apparent. In addition to optimi image optimization techniques, we can utilize simultaneous imaging planes, a sweep capture, and off-axis imaging to isolate pathology and clarify cusp involvement in the regurgitant mechanism. On the right is an example of the use of biplane or multidimensional imaging to isolate pathology. After taking note of valve anatomy, we need to assess LV size and geometry as this is one of the ways we can distinguish between chronic or acute onset of regurgitation. In the case of chronic regurgitation, the left ventricle will begin to remodel and to accommodate the excess volume. And over time, the function will decrease due to the continued volume overload. This finding is also pertinent to, to the grading algorithm mentioned earlier. Other 2D imaging findings you may notice with significant aortic regurgitation are impedance of the mitral valve opening during diastole, as you can see in the image on the left, um, and fluttering of the anterior mit mitral leaflet on M mode, as you can see on the right. In cases of acute onset severe AR, one may notice early closure of the mitral valve due to rapid equalization of pressures. We will now discuss the role of Doppler methods in the assessment of native aortic regurgitation. Beyond evaluating valve appearance and LV size and geometry by 2D imaging, color Doppler gives several qualitative and semi-quantitative parameters with which to evaluate AR. 
It is important to note that visual assessment of AR by color Doppler only is incomplete and quantification is a must. We will touch on quantifications by color Doppler, such as jet width, LVOT width ratio, jet area, LVOT area ratio, vena contracta, and PISA. As we evaluate aortic regurgitation with color Doppler, we must remember that color gain, Nyquist limit, and even transducer frequency must be properly adjusted so as not to over or underestimate the regurgitant jet. This image illustrates the anatomy of a color Doppler jet. This form can be appreciated anytime there's a higher velocity flow through a reduced orifice. You can see here we have the flow convergence or PISA radius, the vena contracta, and the jet area. Familiarity with this jet structure, structure is vital to accurate measurements. We first notice the regurgitant jet width in our parasternal long axis view and make a qualitative assessment of the severity based on how wide the jet is. In a zoomed image of the LDOT and aortic valve in this view, we can measure both the LDOT diameter and the regurgitant jet width to obtain the jet width LDOT width ratio. It is important to note that the jet width in the LDOT should be measured within one centimeter of the vena contracta and is not itself the vena contracta. Jet width LVOT width ratio is not ideal in eccentric jets, as the AR may be underestimated. A accurate measurements of the LVOT diameter um, is vital to the validity of the overall measurement. In this picture, we have the jet width LVOT width ratio of, uh, of 23%, which is considered mild. You can see that the measurement of the jet is within one centimeter of the vena contracta. And it may be helpful to shift the color baseline to fully appreciate all components of the jet to determine where to measure. The jet width may appear different throughout diastole, so it is helpful to scroll through each frame and take several measurements before settling on a final measurement. The jet width, jet width LVOT width ratio is an easy semi-quantitative measurement that is a must, um, a must have in grading AR severity. It is on the front line of analysis on the algorithm, and so be sure to include this in your reporting. In order to obtain the jet area LVOT area ratio, ensure that you are in a zoomed short axis view of the aortic valve with color Doppler. One is then ready to scroll through the clip and trace the area of the LVOT and the area of the color jet. This will give us a rough estimate of the regurgitant orifice area. As with any measurement, there are considerations and drawbacks, and here the direction and shape of the jet may over or underestimate the jet area. Another consideration in obtaining this measurement is the dynamic nature of both the jet and the LVOT. If possible, have the patient hold respirations while acquiring and utilize multidimensional imaging planes to ensure you're within one centimeter of the vena contracta. Note on the bottom left, the biplane cursor is not in the LVOT, though in short axis it appears so. And on the bottom right, the cursor is aligned properly and the LVOT appears much smaller. That being said, this measurement does not appear on the algorithm and is really a backup tool for helping support other findings. Vena contracta is the last of the semi-quantitative measures that we will cover. It's recommended in the ASC guidelines that it be obtained in the zoomed parasternal long axis view with color. So it is possible to get the vena contracta in any view that you have an optimal image of the regurgitant jet with all three components visible. The vena contracta measurement is useful with eccentric jets, it's independent of flow rate, and a quick tool for measuring mild or severe AI. On the other hand, its limitations include being less accurate with multiple jets and is dependent on visualization of the PISA radius or convergence zone. There are two ways to calculate the effective regurgitant orifice area, the PISA method and the stroke volume method, which we will cover in a later slide. In order to measure the EROA by PISA method, align the intonation beam with the regurgitant flow obtain a continuous wave Doppler waveform and trace it. Then move the color baseline in the direction of the regurgitant jet and capture. 
As you scroll through the frames, it is ideal to find the flow convergence that corresponds to the peak flow of the continuum, continuous wave Doppler, Doppler tracing. Again, it may be useful to measure several samples of the flow convergence to get an ac accurate picture of the regurgitant flow, as small errors in radius measurement can lead to substantial errors in EROA due to the squaring error as mentioned above. Here's an example of tracing the continuous wave Doppler profile and measuring the piezo radius and vena contracta. Both the vena contracta and the EROA fall in the moderate category with an EROA of 0.15 centimeters squared and the vena contracta of 0.34 centimeters. There are all, these are also must-have measurements. Vena contracta is used in the algorithm for initial assessment and PISA is useful if there is a need to further quantify. So always include these measurements when image quality allows. Pulse wave Doppler is an invaluable tool in quantifying the severity of aortic regurgitation by methods such as regurgitant fraction, regurgitant volume, and effective regurgitant orifice area. It is also used in noting diastolic flow reversal throughout the aorta. Though not a quantitative method of evaluation, diastolic flow reversal noted in the proximal descending aorta is a strong supportive sign of significant aortic regurgitation. Be sure to place sample the, the sample volume parallel to aortic flow for a strong and accurate Doppler signal. Look for holodiastolic holo flow reversal as opposed to brief early diastolic flow reversal, as this may be a normal finding. If flow reversal is noted in the abdominal aorta, this is highly suggested of severe AR when AR is present. And here is a nice example of severe AR evidenced by holodiastolic flow reversal in the abdominal aorta. Regurgitant volume, fraction, and EROA are the three truly quantitative measures in evaluating AR severity. You will use these when the AR isn't clearly mild or severe and further investigation is warranted. In order to obtain these flow quantif quantifications, measure the stroke volumes of the LDOT and the mitral valve and be sure to trace the ARVTI as you will need it to calculate the EROA. When obtaining the stroke volume of the mitral valve, be sure to measure the, mi uh, to measure the mitral annulus at mid-diastole and place your sample gate at the annulus level where the, mitral, where the diameter was measured. Here is a closer look at what measurements you need for a regurgitant volume. For the stroke volume method, obtain your LVOT diameter and your LVOT VTI, and then your mitral annulus diameter and mitral valve VTI at the annulus level. As a side note, I want to point out that, a mitral, that mitral annular size varies between the four and the two chamber, and also throughout diastole. So I recommend checking your volumes with multiple methods. The stroke volume method for obtaining regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, and EROA are great for cases with multiple or eccentric regurgitant jets. However, it is not useful in cases with uh, significant mitral regurgitation. When significant MR is present, mitral stroke volume will need to be substituted for pulmonic stroke volume if possible. Once you have the regurgitant volume and the stroke volume of the L LVOT, you can easily calculate regurgitant fraction. To calculate the EROA using the stroke volume method, you will need to trace the ARVTI and plug it into the formula above. Continuous wave Doppler provides us with two qualitative parameters, pressure halftime and jet density. Jet density is proportional to the number of red blood, blood cells reflecting the signal. So the denser the jet, the more regurgitant flow is present. If the jet density is faint, it can indicate mild regurgitation or improper alignment of the intonation beam. A denser waveform indicates at least moderate AR, but cannot differentiate between moderate and severe AR. Pressure halftime represents the time it takes for the equalization of pressure between the aorta and the left ventricle. The steeper the slope, the faster the equalization of pressures. This measurement is affected by left ventricular compliance, so a short pressure halftime may indicate significant AR or diastolic dysfunction. Jet, uh, jet density and pressure halftime are included in the first tier of 
the quantification algorithm, so be sure to routinely include these in your assessment. We will now briefly talk about prosthetic valves. The evaluation and grading of severity of prosthetic valve regurgitation are very similar to that of native aortic regurgitation, as you can see from this table taken from the 2009 recommendations for the evaluation of prosthetic valves. It is still important to assess prosthetic structure and motion as well as LV size and geometry. Though LV, um, the LV may still be dilated if, it's, if the evaluation takes place shortly after valve replacement. The Doppler parameters, qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative are consistent with native valvular regurgitation. The evaluation of prosthetic valves has its own challenges. Aortic um, acoustic shadowing makes obtaining measurements in the long axis view difficult and can also obscure some paravalvular regurgitation. Differentiating between normal physiologic regurgitant jets and abnormal regurgitation can be accomplished by careful evaluation in multiple views and implementing quantitative measures. Unique to prosthetic valves is a paravalvular regurgitation, which can be evaluated and approximated in the short axis view. Less than 10% of the circumference of the valve suggests mild, 10 to 20 suggests moderate, and greater than 20% suggests a severe par paravalvular leak. Transesophageal echocardiography is very useful for further evaluation of regurgitant mechanisms in transthoracic echocardiograms with suboptimal image quality. To evaluate the extent of cusp and or root involvement in infectious process and for pre-surgical valve sparing evaluation. Consider this transthoracic echo of severe AI. The image quality is poorer and we are unable to describe the mechanism of regurgitation. Side by side here we have a short axis of the transthoracic on the left and the transesophageal on the right. Still unclear what the mechanism is by TTE, but the transesophageal echo real, reveals a very rare unicuspid aortic valve. We will briefly consider some noteworthy cases. Our first case is a 66-year-old woman with a bicuspid aortic valve that is post AVR with a 23 millimeter Medtronic Hall single tilting disc prosthesis in 2002. A, pre a previous TTE in 2017 revealed an elevated mean gradient of 23 millimeters of mercury, and she was seeking evaluation for new onset dyspnea on exertion. Here you can see a very quick diastolic flash of AR in the moving picture on the left. And unless you are looking for it, you may miss it or regard it as color aliasing from the mechanical valve or a washing jet. In the 2D frozen image, we can really appreciate the significance of the jet. Again, here in short axis, there's a very quick flash of the regurgitant jet. Now that you can see its shape in the frozen image, see if you can spot it in the clip. The five chamber view gives us another deceptive look with that slow trickle of AR that comes after the flash of the more substantial jet, which may fool us into disregarding it further. This is an example of why relying on color Doppler is so precarious and we need an integrated approach. Pulse wave of the descending aorta reveals holodiastolic reversal and continuous wave of the prosthetic valve in the five chamber gives us this unusual waveform that needs explanation. These Doppler findings are able to save us from missing that regurgitant jet entirely. Fortunately, the transthoracic echo warranted a transesophageal echo and this regurgitation is finally fully appreciated. The heart rate is a little slower in this study, which helps us to catch the jet easier, but we can see that the LVOT uh, jet width ratio will be greater than 65%. 
And this is a transgastric five-chamber view that enables us to get a solid pressure halftime measurement and to evaluate the continuous wave envelope. The vena contracta and PISA ERO will be difficult in this study because of the prosthetic shadowing. And our second case is a 30-year-old male with uh, two months of chronic constitutional symptoms, fever, shortness of breath, and fatigue. And so a, trans a transthoracic echo was ordered. At once, it's easy to see that the aortic valve is abnormal without significant regurgitation. There appears to be vegetation present. In this still frame of the color Doppler, we can see that it is going to be difficult to make those first tier measurements, such as jet width, LVOT width ratio, or vena contracta. This is an example of a faint or incomplete continuous wave Doppler profile, which would signify mild AR. In this case, the regurgitation appears significant, and the Doppler profile may be incomplete due to the misalignment with the intonation beam. You can see how we must use multiple parameters in these cases to create an accurate representation of the severity of the regurgitation. The end-diastolic volume of the four-chamber reveals a significant increase in LV volume, and the 2D measurements can confirm a severely dilated left ventricle. These findings are consistent with the criteria for chronic severe AR in the assessment algorithm. Fortunately, the integrated approach to grading aortic regurgitation severity equips us with multi multiple tools, and the color Doppler and pulse wave Doppler of the abdominal aorta confirm severe regurgitation and holis with holodiastolic flow reversal. This patient went on to have a transesophageal echo to determine the extent of cusp involvement, and it appears that vegetation is associated with the right coronary cusp. These color Doppler images reveal how eccentric the jet is, and this illustrates how the jet width LVOT width ratio may be underestimated in eccentric jets, and also how vena contracta can still be measured um, to, to quantify eccentric jets. As you can see, you could measure it right here. To quickly sum up our presentation, again, here are the parameters for grading aortic regurgitation severity with mild, moderate, and severe values. And circling back to our algorithm, we have covered every method of evaluation mentioned here and can appreciate their place in our comprehensive assessment of aortic regurgitation. These six features should be included in every, included in every evaluation of AR, and if in agreement can bring quick and accurate conclusions. If needed, these quantitative measures can tease out the severity of AR. This concludes the presentation portion of this evening, and I would like to thank our moderators and expert and all of you for your, your attention. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Lucy Safi and Dr. Noreen Kelly. Thank you so much, Cody. I really appreciate that presentation. It was excellent. Thank you for such a thorough evaluation of both quantitative and uh, semi-quantitative methods for assessment of AR. Um, I urge all of the um, presenters and the attendees to um, place any questions they may have in the question and answer box at the bottom. Um, you can send them anonymously or you can use your name, um, but we appreciate any questions that you may have. Um, if I may, I want to ask um, the first question and wanted to ask Dr. Kelly um, and Dr. Lee. Um, there are multiple methods that can be used to measure and quantify aortic regurgitation. In your clinical practice, which of the methods do you find most accurate and which do you find yourself drawn to do um, in, in your studies? So um, in my practice, for sure, kind of top of the list is vena contracta. 
just because of the ability to for it to account for both central and eccentric jets. Um, and then I'm probably more leaning towards things like, um, you know, jet width and jet area. I find the quantitative um, assessment to be very, very difficult and challenging in many cases. And I actually am going to probably ask Dr. Lee a question about how he does that um, subsequently. But so for me, I end up um, relying a lot on Bina Contracta and then the jet area, jet width measurement. Um, and then a little bit of pressure halftime. And I think hopefully at some point we can talk about I think there's a lot of pitfalls with pressure halftime. It can be super helpful in certain cases if you understand kind of how other hemodynamics may affect it. Um, but for sure, those kind of top, those are my top three. Um, Dr. Lee? Yeah, no, you make some really great points. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, really speaks to uh, a lot of the really beautiful cases you showed of that we really can't just rely on Doppler and that you need to use as many clues as possible to uh, as part of this integrative approach. Personally, the, I feel like I can hang my hat on certain things, uh, notably the flow reversal in the thoracic and descending aorta. If I see robust flow reversal in the PW Doppler and the thoracic aorta, I feel very confident that it's at least moderate AI and in the abdominal aorta, uh, at least uh, generally severe AI. Now, I, I agree with you that, that while it's very helpful to try to do these quantifications, there are just so many pitfalls in calculations with doing the, um, the, the stroke volume calculations. So, I mean, even when we're doing aortic stenosis, uh, measuring the LVOT, there's, there's a robust debate about uh, where we should be measuring the LVOT right under the uh, leaflet tips uh, or, or somewhere further down in the LVOT. Uh, and then you add on the, the challenges of getting the sample volume in the correct spot. And then you add the complications of measuring the mitral annulus, which, you know, I think historically we think of as a fairly simplistic oval structure, but I think the more that, that we do this, the more we realize the complexity of the, the area as well. And then, you know, if you can't get a good mitral sample, um, getting a good um, pulmonic sample is equally as challenging. Um, I do think that one of the things that is a little underutilized is trying to use the PISA uh, for quantification. I think in, in transthoracic is challenging, but in TEE, especially for eccentric jets, you can sometimes get a reasonable flow convergence. And so um, that, that's something I keep in my back pocket for, for particularly challenging cases. Yeah, I agree. And just to add to that, I think the deep transgastric view, when you do the color Doppler on these TEs, you can really usually get a nice lined up piece of, uh, piece of jet. But how often um, how often in clinical practice, and this could be for any of the panelists, um, do you rely on PISA? You know, it is difficult to obtain and, and measurement of the radius can, can also be difficult. So how often do you do a PISA? Yeah, so I can go first. So um, we always try and do it, but I think one of the big things for many patients, right, um, maybe they also have concomitant aortic stenosis and that's the kind of calcification restriction of the leaflets is part of what's causing aortic, aortic regurgitation. And then you have that acoustic shadowing which is really preventing you from getting a good kind of PISA, especially on transthoracic echo. So while we try it, I totally agree with Dr. Lee. Um, in our practice, kind of, if people have moderate to severe or severe and any kind of clinical symptoms where you're like, I think this might be more than that, we're going on to additional testing, um, you know, whether that be T or um, as some of the guidelines point to, MRI can have a role in these cases. Um, but it's really, really important, you know, I think to keep in mind, one of the first statements in the guideline is, aortic regurgitation is not normal, right? Like a little bit of MR is normal, a little bit of PR is normal. Aortic regurgitation is not normal. And so especially if you're seeing anything that looks more than trace or mild, we really, really kind of have to hone in on what's causing that, what's the mechanism, because that affects uh, the natural history of what to expect on how quickly this is going to get worse and things like that. And so a lot of attention, I think, needs to be um, placed on kind of getting good 2D images, as, as Cody mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. And, you know, a lot of these quantitative things, I think a lot of us tend to keep uh, in our back pockets for when it's not clear on color, you know. Um, and, and so one of the things that I look for when I'm starting the study is sort of as Cody mentioned, is start with the color, see if it's, it's pretty obvious just based on your initial setting. You know, are you seeing some hemodynamic responses such as LV dilation? Um, and then what I try to spend a lot of time doing is finding out in my images is what are the pitfalls of our traditional measurements that I want to disregard and, and want to delve deeper with additional techniques. So one thing I notice a lot is, 
you know, the, the leak in most of the examples that, that Cody showed is oftentimes very central, uh, whether it's from cusp dilation. Um, but, you know, oftentimes the leak may be along the entire commissure. And if it's along a commissure that's in the plane that you're imaging the parasternal long axis, you could actually get a very small amount of leak that looks very large when you're talking about jet width. And so, so that's why I spend a lot of time doing is looking for pitfalls and why I can throw out certain pieces of data. So um, a question for you, Dr. Lee. So I like love pressure half time because it's easy to kind of keep in my mind, like greater than 500 mild, you know, less than 250 severe. Um, talk a little bit, um, if you don't mind, about some of the hemodynamic things you need to keep in mind when you're trying to interpret pressure half time. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. I think so many people tend to try to hang their hats on the pressure half time. And I think it's really important to remember, as Cody said, that the value of pressure half time tends to be mostly in acute AI. And so, you know, when we're in a, a case in the in cath lab doing some complex procedure where we may, you know, have a valve migrate or, or do something like a valve lethal laceration, you see that AI right away. Um, you know, I, I think the, the pressure at halftime tends to be pretty reliable, but so many cases in, in severe chronic AI, the pressure at halftime is just has so many confounding factors. Anything that is going to lower your systemic diastolic pressure or increase your LV end diastolic pressure is going to decrease that gradient and really going to affect uh, the fidelity of that measurement. So if you have chronic heart failure, um, if you have severe MR, uh, any of these things are going to increase your diastolic pressure and create the uh, aberrancies in, in the pressure half time. So really the value is in an otherwise normal heart and some acute change that the heart hasn't had a chance to, to adapt to yet. Um, so this is a question for you, but also um, Dr. Safi as well. So, um, you know, traditionally we've looked at LV end diastolic diameter in the parasternal long view as kind of one of the parameters we think about in severe aortic regurgitation about whether someone needs to go to surgery, right? Um, but I think um, data has started to, sh started to show that not does it necessarily kind of lengthen like that or widen like that, but in many times it lengthens first and that getting volumetric measurements may actually be more important. So are you routinely getting um, biplane volumes and following them in addition to LV and diastolic diameters in your AI patients? I can answer that first. So in my AI patients, what I do is um, I, I always do my own um, biplane measurements and get volumes and, you know, index them to BSA because, you know, it's important to follow them. I report them, uh, both the end diastolic and end systolic volume index in my reports. And that's what I actually I follow on ECHO um, for my chronic AR patients. Yeah, you know, I, I tend to use a lot of the 2D end diastolic dimension and end systolic dimension measurements still for, for the simple reason that it's, it's simple, it's clean. Typically, your parasternal long axis is going to give your highest fidelity images. And, and to some degree, reproducibility matters a lot in these types of patients, especially when you're comparing from every six months to year to year to year. You know, you want something that, that you're going to be able to track changes over time. And, and I feel like the, the 2D measurement is very reliable to do that if you've taken the time to really optimize that image. Uh, that being said, you know, there is a lot of value in getting 3D images, and, um, but the simple reality, I think, is a lot of labs just don't have a lot of 3D probes. There's a lot of issues with getting a good quality 3D data set, um, and, and differences between how people are tracing the endocardium versus how the automated systems work. So I, I think that this is the future, and this is how we're going to be moving, and, and certainly, you know, uh, looking at the data from MRI, uh, volumes uh, can be very helpful to prognosticate. And for echo, we're, we're not doing it quite routinely yet. Uh, but one more point on that fact is the question of whether the cutoffs we have for moving to surgery in patients um, are currently optimal. There, there's some interesting data a few years ago from uh, Dr. Desai's group out of the Cleveland Clinic suggesting that uh, we may need to be intervening on these patients even earlier before they start to really dilate to the, the levels that we're seeing now. So I think this is an ongoing discussion and something that we're going to uh, really see some movement on as, as time goes on in the next few years. Yeah, I look forward to in our next kind of guidelines, um, hopefully integrating some data on volumes, because I think, um, as you both mentioned, the best data from an echo point of view is LB and diastolic diameter, so that's what we've kind of hung our hat on, but that's even coming into question and just need some, because obviously we know MRI volumes and echo volumes are not necessarily one-to-one -one, and there's differences in kind of, you know, MRI being the gold standard in terms of volume, but what we get on echo, what, what is the equivalent to that? And um, look forward to new sets of guidelines coming out to incorporate that. 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the bottom line I would take from, from anything that we're using to make uh, clinical decisions on for, for surgery or anything else is, is it doesn't have to be perfect, right? Ground truth, um, you know, I, I think those of us that do a fair amount of MRI, you know, oftentimes we talk about MRI as the gold standard, but if you've ever sat in the lab and watched people trace the endocardium, I mean, you can, you can bump the EF and the volumes a, a, a little bit here and there, right? So uh, I think more important than ground truth is reproducibility. It's something that multiple people do and will get the same number each and every time. So we're getting a lot of great questions from the audience. I encourage you to um, ask questions if you have them. Uh, one of the questions that has come through is, uh, does the level of the systemic blood pressure have any impact on the qualitative and quantitative estimation of aortic regurgitation? So Dr. Lee or Dr. Kelly, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think certainly the blood pressure, although it's not an emphasis in the guidelines, uh, certainly can make a difference, right? Because as with all things color Doppler, the faster the flow, the more prominent that jet will look. So if you have a, um, you know, a diastolic uh, pressure that's, that's 120, um, you know, that jet's going to be moving faster and certainly will look more prominent than otherwise. And, and as we also mentioned earlier, will affect the, the pressure halftime just based on the, the increase in the gradient between the LV and the L, LV, or the uh, aorta and LV and diastolic dimension. Yeah, I would say the other part is, you know, as, as you mentioned, Dr. Lee there, someone who has a diastolic blood pressure of 120 is probably unlikely to have significant aortic regurgitation, you know, and so we, and again, this actually blood, getting an accurate blood pressure at the time of the echo comes into effect for so many different valvular heart disease. And, you know, we probably don't, uh, you know, speaking from my own lab personally, put enough emphasis on really making sure we have the most accurate blood pressure at the time to reflect that patient's hemodynamics to maybe explain things. But I think also, you know, when that jet width really looks wide is often in the apical views and we know that lateral resolution on echo isn't always is, isn't as good as other resolution and so another thing to take into account so it again i don't put much stock into necessarily how wide how wide it goes into the ventricle and apical views or how far into the ventricle it goes yeah that's such a great point though about making sure we take accurate blood pressures i mean really if you've got the time it's really ideal to to do it at the time and, and sort of document and annotate what the pressure is I mean, in the cath lab all the time we see, uh, you know, 20 millimeters of mercury. Even today I saw uh, a case where, you know, the, the MR very, virtually disappeared um, at a systolic blood pressure of 100 and was uh, clearly severe at a blood pressure of 120, 130. And so these subtle changes in blood pressure really can make a big difference in, in the hemodynamic approach. Um, so Dr. Lee, we have a question um, that says, what are your thoughts on using 3D for aortic regurgitation? Is it mostly just for research or using it in a clinical setting? So I guess when we're talking about 3D, we talked a little bit about 3D volumes from a quantification standpoint. And, and, and I think if you're a lab that has 3D probes, you've got folks that are experienced with doing it, can do it reproducibly and do it well, I, I think it's reasonable to integrate that into a, a clinical approach. I think that you do need to be at a lab where there is an emphasis uh, on this because it is, uh, as folks that probably do a lot of 3D know, it is a very specific skill set uh, that's a little different than getting your regular 2D images. Um, now, there are other 3D techniques out there for quantification, so uh, I'm not sure whether the, the uh, question being asked is maybe some of the 3D color uh, techniques. Um, you know, I, I think the uh, there is sort of qualitative value in getting 3D color of the LVOT, uh, even though that's not really a, a focus in the guidelines, but you can get a sense of whether the jet is eccentric uh, or whether it's uh, sort of blowing more into the LVOT itself. Um, I do think one of the things that is uh, mentioned in the guidelines is the 3D vena contracta and the area which, which I, I do find helpful in sort of the case where I'm really looking for tiebreakers. You know, is this moderate? Is this severe? Uh, which way am I trying to, to kick it to? Um, and, and I think a, a reasonable amount of data is, is been developed to, to get a sense that, that that can be helpful to tip it. But it, it's not my primary um, diagnostic criteria at this point. Similarly, I don't use it as the sole uh, diagnostic parameter, but I use it as an addition to all the other. So if I have great pictures on 3D and I'm able to get a direct vena contracta um, area of the regurgitant jet, then I will report it. Um, but I don't use that as my only or sole uh, parameter. 
we got another great question from the audience um, regarding holodiastolic flow reversal. Um, are there any other conditions aside from significant AI that can be that we should be mindful for that can lead to holodiastolic flow reversal in the uh, descending aorta? So I guess I'll rely on my other panelists to correct me if I have this wrong. So I think if you see um, holodiastolic flow reversal in the abdominal aorta, and it's of a similar VTI as the forward flow, um, then that's probably significant aortic regurgitation. And um, if you move into the kind of proximal descending thoracic aorta, there's a few other conditions that can kind of come in, like in people with AV fistulas, I think they can sometimes have flow reversal if people have very stiff aortas that can sometimes, small stiff aortas that can sometimes be seen. But my general rule is if you've seen aortic regurgitation that you thought was, you know, moderate or so, and you have that flow reversal, you should probably be thinking about upgrading the severity. Um, I don't think I've ever actually truly seen, although, it, you know, the guidelines talk about these other scenarios where you can see flow reversal. I don't think I've actually ever seen it in someone who didn't have significant aortic regurgitation it, to a prominent way where, you know, forward flow VTI um, versus reversal VTI were the same and things like that, which we talked about kind of using as a metric to really make sure it's accurate what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, any type of, I guess, I guess high flow diastolic collateral, maybe if you have like a coarctation with very, very large, you know, arterial to venous collaterals and, and things like that. But in, in general, I mean, a lot of these things it would be unusual for someone like that to come to the lab without knowing what you're getting yourself into to begin with. But, uh, you know, sometimes these folks do walk into the clinic de novo. So good to be aware. So question for you, since you brought up the debate, and it's a question we were asked, and we did talk about the uh, need to uh, quantify stroke volume for some of the quantitative measures. Where are you measuring your LVOT diameter? So I, I measure at the... Um, uh, just under the aortic valve leaflet tips where I can uh, see it most cleanly. I think the, the problem measuring it more proximally is that there's so much variability in the basal septal bulge. Um, and, you know, if that basal septal bulge is curving in a large way, uh, from, from study to study, you know, the reproducibility, I think, is, is difficult. The other thing, reason that I do that is doing a lot of CTs for TAVRs. We know that the aortic annulus is an oval structure rather than being round. And then the parasternal long axis tends to be the shorter of the two dimensions. And so uh, maximizing that dimension uh, at just under the leaflet tips, I found to be the most consistent with uh, getting uh, uh, the uh, a measurement that makes sense uh, when I'm calculating in my continuity equation for aortic stenosis. When you say leaflet tips, you mean the base of the annulus, right? Yeah, so, so uh, the virtual plane will be virtual inserting, but, but not into the sort of the muscular portion of the LVOT. Yeah, and that's what we've moved to in our practice as well as um, basically right where those leaflets insert in the LVOT. Um, oh, yes, leaflet base, not leaflet tip. Yeah, okay, I just wanted to clarify in case we got another follow-up question on that. So let me ask a question about eccentric jets, because these can be very challenging. Um, when you have an eccentric jet, um, do you rely on the vena contracta um, or, you know, do you use other measures? I mean, it's really difficult when you have these, these jets that maybe wrap around and especially in like bicuspid valves. So what do you do? What are some helpful hints that, you know, what, what could you give any hints to the sonographers or to the fellows in training uh, regarding eccentric jets? Yeah, these, these are so challenging, right? Um, because it just, just like MR, um, the, the jet can be so thin, it can have a, you know, the, the and, and not really represent by color the amount of leaking that's going on. And so uh, the first thing is, is you need good images and a sonographer that's really working hard to sweep um, in, the, in the peristernal long to try to bring that jet out so you can see the, the length of it as well as uh, sort of sweeping around the short axis to prove to you that that jet is there. Um, th these are situations where uh, finding a lot of secondary characteristics are helpful. So, you know, issues with um, uh, the mitral leaflet with premature closure, diastolic MR, LV dilation, 
and, and a lot of these things like the, the flow reversal in the thoracic and descending aorta. Um, but, you know, in, in these situations, it's, it's so hard to rely on the vena contracta itself. The other thing I do look for in cases like this are, are clear anatomic pathology with the leaflets. Sometimes if you get a nice zoomed up uh, picture of that valve and the long axis, you can actually see the prolapse or flail portion of that cusp going down and gives you, um, if you see the true anatomic disruption of the valve leaflet, that may give you a sense that you might want to upgrade the severity of what's going on because you can see that there's, there's something truly uh, going on rather than just a, a coaptation issue at the, the leaflet tips. Uh, Noreen, I don't know if you have anything to add to that? No, totally. The one thing I will say is, and we've, um, you know, had a couple of these cases where, um, you know, we've even missed this in our lab is, um, and I just, if you brought up as you talked about it. So in people that have prosthetic valves and acute AI, it can be really hard to see the leaflet abnormality because of the shadowing from the prosthesis, especially by a, by a prosthetic valves. Um, and so kind of asking the patient, why are they there? You know, what's going on? New onset shortness of breath, new onset chest pain that just happened like that. You know, yesterday they're fine, today I'm short of breath, often as a, a cusp tear. And, and because the AI is acute, it can be, you know, rapid equalization of pressures and not big color Doppler jets. And um, as Cody showed, that was one of our cases from our lab where actually what was happening with that mechanical valve was that it had panis and it was delayed in closure. And so she would get this huge rush of AI for a short period of time. And actually, while she was waiting to get worked up um, for surgery two weeks later in the interim, the valve just completely got stuck open and she came in a shock and went for emergent surgery. And so these, you know, I try and tell our sonographers, I mean, the, the work we do saves lives, it's critical. And so really trying to do your best to get the best answer you can. And then also I think equally as important is acknowledging when we can't see something, you know, like I, I often say in reports, it's at least this, but because it's eccentric and because it's, you know, wall impinging, it may be more. Um, so that it prompts the ordering provider to say like, you know what, their symptoms seem pretty bad. Maybe I should do the next test. Maybe I should do that TE like we did in that lady with the mechanical valve to try and get more information. I don't know what you think about that, Dr. Sathy. Well, oh, or Dr. Lee, sorry. Oh, oh sorry. I, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I agree so much with that. You know, we, we tend to, to be as, as echo people. You know, we, we want the answer. We have such a great tool and, and we don't want to admit defeat. You know, we want to get the answer. But I, I think I've seen so many cases where we've got great images and then you see on an invasive angiogram in the root shot, the, the, the leak is wide open, you know? And, and, and I, I think we just need to use all the tools at our disposal, whether it's echo, MRI, cath, uh, and just to get the answer for patient care. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Dr. Safi. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I agree, obviously, with both of you, um, you know, prosthetic valves in general, the shadowing um, is very challenging. And so using, you know, if you're doing a T, deep transgastric views, or if you're doing transthoracics, doing the subcostals, trying to get different angles, get the shadow out of the way and see what you can get with either spectral Doppler or color Doppler is your, is your best bet. Um, and, and, you know, regurgitation, whether it's paravalvular or valvular, valvular can be challenging. And, you know, it's really surprising how you see nothing in the mid-esophageal views on TE, and then you go into the deep transgastric and there's this huge jet. So, you know, don't forget to use these other angles and other views in order to help um, support, you know, your, your hypothesis. And, and I, I would add in one more thing on that note is it's important to remember the guidelines are guidelines, right? And if something doesn't seem right, something is, is not matching up perfectly, uh, you, you need to use your intuition and, and use everything at your disposal. Uh, for, for example, when we talk about transcatheter valves, I mean, this is uh, a large burden of the prosthetic valves going in these days. And if you look at the, the you know, the guidelines don't specifically at, address uh, transcatheter valves, but if you look at the, the VARC criteria, where they talk about the amount of regurgitation has to do with the sort of uh, area and the perimeter around. To, to some degree that makes sense, but then you can certainly have jets where the, the jet is very uh, thick and, and wide at that spot, but doesn't actually encompass a very large circumference of that, of that valve. And so, you know, don't hang your hat on any one thing. Don't take any one parameter or word or guideline as gospel and use everything at your disposal. Yeah, I think my uh, takeaway, I like to share this story because it's something that happened to me is be curious, right? So if something doesn't make sense, try and figure it out. So I had um, a patient who, you know, young woman in her 40s or and she came in with chest pain and, and they did an echo and she had kind of mild to moderate AI. And we we're like, that's kind of weird. You know, why does she have mild to moderate AI? And she didn't want to stay for the evaluation. So she ended up leaving. 
and came back because she was still having chest pain four days later. And it turned out she had a very focal aortic dissection um, at the commissure where that aortic regurgitation was happening. And that aortic regurgitation was the key to what was probably her chest pain and the dissection. Um, and, you know, so it's that kind of wanting to go the next step to say like, okay, well, wait, why would this person all of a sudden have this very focal, you know, regurgitation between these two commissures? What, what could possibly be going on there? And so, and again, the answer may not happen with transthoracic echo. In this case, it didn't, um, you know, but it's important to kind of put out there what we know and, and so we can take the best care of patients. Absolutely. Um, so we're reaching uh, the top of the hour, and I just wanted to thank um, Cody for an excellent presentation today. I wanted to thank Dr. Lee and Dr. Kelly for joining me today. Um, I encourage uh, all the attendees uh, to continue to stay tuned. We will post our next webinar, uh, which will be on mitral stenosis on the ASC SIGE3 website. So look forward to that. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, have a great night. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.